Hi, and welcome to another episode of This Old Church. I'm Dan Mowry. Today we're going to join Dan Olson and Randall Jarge as they explore the mechanics of heating Plymouth Church. Welcome to another episode of This Old Church. I'm your host, Dan Olson, facility manager of Plymouth Church, and I'm here with Randall Jarge. And he is working on our boilers today, and he's calibrating the burners. And Randall, uh, what do we got going on here? Well, for to make sure that the burner is operating safely and efficiently, what we usually do every year, there's there's a lot of things we do, but one of the main things is to do a combustion analysis of the burner, and so that we can we can get the different readings. And if you look at this, you can see our different readings um, and this, our CO2 readings and CO readings. Um, and this this would uh, optimize our efficiency for yeah, our boilers. We, with, with like these burners, you want to make sure that you're at least an 80% efficient. And so we have to make sure that the combustion, the burn is correct so that the air fuel mixture is correct on these burners. So that we're not producing a lot of CO and and that we're also saving, you know, as much money as we can save right. by having it run as efficient as we, you know, we can we can make it. Right. And usually, what I end up doing, there's a certain input, there's a certain gas input to it, and then we just adjust the air to the gas fuel ratio in order to get the 80 percent. These burners will only, uh, you'll see, it's a little more than 80 percent on a lower fire with less steam. Um, and by the way, these are steam boilers, yeah. and... Now this type of boiler actually is a, what they call a cast iron sectional. And so when I started here, we had what they called a fire tube boiler, which was much bigger. I think we were over capacity significantly, and these are much smaller, and these are the cast iron sectionals, like I said. And what that means is that if you come over here and take some of the skin off of this thing and look in here, this was installed in 2005, and they actually brought this in. And the reason that we went with this type of boiler was because we're in the middle of the building, we're in the basement, there's no way to get a boiler in here, of like a fire tube type of boiler, like we had before, a very large uh, boiler. So what they did was they actually brought this in in pieces. Each one of these is an individual piece, and I don't know the exact weight on those things, but they have to weigh at least 500 pounds a piece, wouldn't they? A minimum. Yeah. Yeah, minimum. And all these, this, this whole boiler came in in pieces, and they assembled it right here on the spot. And so every year, what we end up doing, at the, beginning, at the end of the year, at the beginning of the year, is we take all these, all these covers off, and you can see this. And then when we start this, when we start this up for the uh, for the winter, what I have to do is I have what they call as a hydro test, is to pressurize the system and make sure we don't have any leaks between all of these. So those are all sealed between the sections, and when I pressurize the system to what the boiler is rated for, then I come in and I look um, at everything and see, make sure that there's no leaks that have developed over uh, any period of time. And, and then... But so these would, these would be low pressure boilers. Yeah, these are low pressure steam boilers. So we'd yeah. operate them only up to 14 pounds. 15 pounds. Yeah. Well, 15 Four. pound is the rating, but we operate around seven pounds. Right. And when you do your hydro test, what happens with this relief valve back here? Well, there's, there's different ways, you know, but I do try to blow the relief. And if we don't blow the relief, this would be like the relief valve that you have on your residential uh, residential hot water heater right here. And uh, if you lift that up, that'll blow water out the same as your residential style hot water heater. If you're not doing that at home, I wouldn't recommend that you do it because the valve might not reseat and you'll have a leak. Uh, but we do that here periodically just to make sure that uh, the valves will function in the, in the case of an emergency where if we were to exceed uh, 14 pounds, get to 15 pounds, that thing will open up and discharge. 
In, in the beginning of the season, we initially check that and we find that, you know, if they fail, we replace them. And we have found that some have failed. Several times. So, we found uh, that we replace them. Even though we're at the end of the year, they're still checked monthly. Um, they're blown down and checked, but um, when they've been sitting for a long time, we check them, hydro test it, see if it will maintain, it will blow, and it, if it doesn't, we replace the whole. Let's take a look at some of our other safety features up here while we're talking safety. So on the steam boiler on this one here, what there is, there's a float in there, and then there's a bunch of electrical contacts in here. So the level, as you can see right here in the side glass. That's actually that, the water level inside this boiler. Yeah, that's okay. the water level inside the boiler. Yeah. And this one here, what it will do is it will kick on a feed water pump. So if that water level drops to a certain level, this one will kick on a feed water pump and fill it back up. And this one also, if the water level continues to drop, this one will shut the burner off so that the burner won't, sh won't operate. So if the burner is operating and the water level gets too low, this one will try to kick the pump on to fill it up. If it doesn't fill it up, this one will also shut it off. But this is an automatic one, so when the water level comes up, then it will re-enable the burner, and then the pump will shut off when the water level gets to the point. So that's the primary that's one safety. And so if, if, we, if our water level is here and it drops down here, then this thing, if this thing were not here, our, and it's, it's calling our pump, then it doesn't shut off. If it doesn't shut off and our, it calls for our pumps to operate, dumps cold water into that hot boiler, what's going to happen? Well, we, you don't want to dump cold water into the boiler, so what we do is we're dumping in condensate that's recovered from there. Right. Um, so we don't ever put don't pull water in right it because it will shock the boiler it's like having something uh a temperature uh 230 some degrees our and best case scenario would 60 be degree water a cracked section yeah our, our, yeah that would be our it best would, case scenario. it would shock it and probably bust something and on the other side of this wall right over here is our gymnasium where our nursery school children play and right. um there are several things that could go wrong if we didn't have these safeties, and that's the children over there are obviously our number one priority. Yeah. Um, above energy efficiency, above everything, are mm -hmm. our kids in the gymnasium. But uh, we could uh, potentially uh, really have an issue here like they used to have all the time back at the, the turn of the century with uh, the old coal, coal fire boilers uh, before they had all this technology. Yeah. And we have more safeties too, like this one here. So that one's an automatic. It will shut things off. But let's say that the boiler water still continues to drop. Then this one's a manual. So it will trip and then it will shut the burner off and it won't start it until somebody comes down here and and pushes this reset to make sure that uh, that it'll start. So we we have that one, which will shut it off just so the pump can bring it up. This one, if it gets down this to this level here, then it will completely shut the burner down so we don't run, we don't operate the burner when there's no water in the boiler. So when I set up, when I check the burners out, or I take this gauge off, this is just for, that's just for a visual. That's the gas pressure to the burner. So I'll take and put a digital one on there, take that out. So I know what the gas pressure is. So when I show you one, when I sh we're just going to look at one point of efficiency. And I actually look at several points of efficiency. So I, I run this burner at a low fire, and then I increment it up um, several times and look at the efficiency because there are times where there might be a problem mid-fire. It might look good on low fire, but then you get to mid-fire and it's really bad. So this is the one that actually modulates it when we set that control. This is the one that looks at the steam pressure. And then as we have no steam pressure, it'll go to high fire. And then as we get closer to where we'll have seven pounds of steam pressure, it'll back it off to low fire. 
And so, so this thing is actually kind of thinking for itself, right. being the most energy efficient that it right. could possibly be. Right. And I'm looking at this, and I know this is a Gordon Pyatt uh, burner, but these are not the original controls as it would come from the factory, right? You well, these, yeah, these aren't here because we had a, they don't make this particular burner uh, anymore in the parts. Um, so this was a circuit board. This whole, there was like a circuit board that included all these here. And so what I had to do was figure out, because there's no wiring diagram, I had to figure out the wiring of the circuit board and then wire them all up. And I just, I'm just pointing that out because uh, I think a lot of people that would come in here to work on this thing wouldn't think to do that. And uh, we'd probably end up with maybe a new burner. Right. <laughs> because you couldn't, we couldn't get that circuit board yeah. um, that, was, that did all this. And the thing was, um, it wouldn't, it would just stay on a low fire and we couldn't get it to do anything. Right. So, Okay, well, do you want to fire this up so we can yep. see that energy efficiency stuff work for us? Our pilot's on. We're looking at whether we have a pilot. It's controlled. If we have a good signal, now I'm being gassed. All right, so we have the boilers all warmed up and we're gonna turn them on. Uh, we have them off right now so you can hear us for the audio. And uh, we're gonna turn them on and Randall's gonna show us how the different blowdowns work here. So let's go ahead and do that. <laughs> still sounds like it's running after you do that, that's because it's purging the furnace and sending it up through the, through the chimney. It's clearing out the combustion chamber. Okay. And so now the burner, since we did this one here, this is the, the lowest level that the boiler could even have before it would actually not operate the burner, period. And so now this is a manual reset. So this will pretty much just sit like this until somebody comes down and resets it. And there's a little reset in the back, and as soon as I push that, it'll start right back up again. And what we did was we created uh, a false alarm, basically, right. by purging the water out of this pipe. This thing thinks it's empty, it's shutting down, and we're testing it. Right. So it, we know that it's going to work in, in the case of an actual emergency. Right, and that's done quite often. Yeah. Um, weekly, is this thing is tested to make sure and then also all this piping is checked at the beginning of the year. All these are taken off to make sure the piping is all clear. There's no obstructions. And then this also will help keep it clear. And so now if this were really the water level was that low, this is where it would say we'd have no heat. And then you come in and let me go ahead and push that. Yeah. So this is off the main steam header here. So when the, when the steam does turn to condensate because it cools down, you have to get rid of it. On this steam header, you want to get rid of all that condensate, and that's what these do is get rid of the condensate. And so there's two, two problems. One, you want to get rid of the condensate, so if these are plugged up and don't allow removal of the condensate, one, usually if it's on a header, you're going to get a lot of noise, and you're going to get some really bad bang. But if it's if it's on a uh, heating unit, you'll have no heat because there's no steam going in because there's no way for the condensate to go away. So when the steam comes in, 
and then the heat source or your your heating source for your building cools that down the condensate goes down to the bottom if you don't get rid of it if it plugs up you have no heat now the, then you have the opposite problem that if this is just wide open now you you just have steam running through it all the time um, actually that's where your energy efficiency really comes into is because what it'll do is you'll just have steam coming out the other side of this pipe. This side of the pipe is open uh, to the atmosphere. This side is the steam line coming right. in. And so and, um, the, the energy usage that you would have if you had a wide open steam valve, um, I've been told that if you replace a faulty steam trap that it should pay for itself in a matter of three months or so. Because, and, because based on the cost of what the steam trap is versus the energy savings. And it's it's relative to, you know, the system too, but it still is, your cost is definitely, you want to replace it whenever right. there's anything. And like we do here is we inspect them um, yeah, yeah, yearly yeah. to find out how many are bad and how many are good to make sure beginning at the start of the season, you know, that everything's working okay. okay. While we're in this room, Let's take a look at what you've got going on over here with this pump. So we were getting a lot of noise out of this pump. And, uh, we've got two circulating pumps on this system. Can you tell us what you found here with this pump? Well, with this pump, we've got a bad seal. So when we come in here, um, all the water in the system was actually coming out and draining out. You can see where it had been running out. So the first problem is that we have a seal, and usually then we start to have um, bearing problems. And you can see that this motor is has gotten real hot. So it's running a lot hotter, so the bearings are are, are probably pretty much shot on it. It was, it was pulling more amps than it should have been pulling. So we had two problems, and they're both probably caused by this seal that was leaking. So instead of doing trying to piecemeal everything together, it's better just to replace the whole pump, and then that way we know we have new bearings, uh, we have new bearings, and we have um, a new seal. And this uh, this system has two pumps on it. The one that you're looking at there uh, would handle the rehearsal hall area and um, center for spiritual growth area, and the one over here okay. uh, that takes care of the office level. Uh, and looking at this one, you can see it's a lot newer, and the reason for that is because probably about four years ago, I got a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning from the fire department uh, to let me know that we had an alarm going off, and I came over here at 2 o'clock in the morning not expecting to find anything. I was expecting a normal false alarm, and we opened the store, the fire department and myself, and smoke rolled out of this room. and. That's why we decided it was a better option to replace everything with the pump that Randall is currently working on versus trying to piecemeal it together because that's a pretty scary experience. Well, let's head on upstairs and take a look at that other steam heat exchanger that I was promising folks that we'd get a seat. Okay. We're up here looking at the main building steam heat exchanger, and it's uh, the same principles as the smaller one that we looked at downstairs. If you look here, this guy here, what is that, Randall? Yeah, this is this is a, a trap, a steam trap. So it's the same it's, thing that we were looking at, that little tiny guy hanging up on the pipe downstairs, right. only on a much larger scale. Right. And the condensate comes in here, and goes into that trap and it's the same thing and then it returns down the boiler on this pipe right here. That's where the condensate returns to. So there's the steam steam main, this is the steam main from the boilers coming up. And then it splits so that there's two two different control valves that maintain the temperature of the water coming in and out. And they, they have two different control valves because, because of the actual flow rating of the valve, 
it's you can fine tune it better having two of them than just having one large one and you can reach the capacity that you want. So they'll always have two of them, um, usually one large one and one smaller one, so that the building automation can control the steam coming into this heat exchanger better, and that's why there's two of them. But, so there, we have that in this system. So this is the new system. Um, goes to all the new fan core units at the that other side. 2003 edition. Yeah. So this goes to that, and we have glycol in this particular loop instead of water. Um, because we, we go to areas that it could freeze, so we want to make sure we have glycol in it. And we were much, talking earlier, glycol is not as efficient for heat transfer as just plain water, is that correct? Yeah, but you, you really won't you know, notice as, as much, it, it will affect your pump and your flow capacity and a little bit different heat transfer, different, the different propylene compared to the ethylene glycol has different transfer characteristics. Uh -huh. We have propylene because it's safer. Ethylene has somewhat of a little bit different transfer, you know, rate. And I've, I've, but, I've heard that it's safer, I don't mean to cut you off, but so, for example, if we were to have a leak with this, it wouldn't be a chem spill. Right. You, you could go right down right. the drain. In yeah. fact, they use this stuff to manufacture chocolate. Yeah, this is the safe stuff, the safe glycol, um, the propylene that we have in here. Uh, but, and then, uh, so this is basically the same thing as what we looked at downstairs, oh. but on steroids. Yeah. So that pump that you're replacing, that would be like one of these giant pumps right behind us here. So we have we have the two pumps, and what they do is they for the energy efficiency too. We don't just kick them on and run them; they actually modulate. The pressure switch speeds them up and slows them down according to how many places we need heat. And we have two of them. One will run at a time. We don't um, it's, we alternate them between the two. We don't run them both at the same time. We either run one or the other one. Is, is one a complete redundancy to the other one then, or do yeah, we have enough, capac much. You have enough capacity on well, they, one? They sized them for yours, they sized them so that one is the, the capacity. Right. So you always want, you know, a second one, but you don't want one just sitting there. Right. So you, you rotate these, I think, every week or so, yeah. you'll rotate them, because you don't want one just sitting there not running. Even one pump is for the whole system, size for the whole system, it'll ramp up and down, but then you want to exercise each one of them, when you want to make sure they work, and um, if you want to exercise each one of them, so it'll switch to the next pump, so we get the same amount of operating hours on each pump, so if one does fail, it will automatically kick on the second one, and you get alarms, and then you don't have to sit here and find out that well, you have no heat in the building. Right. You get alarmed, alarmed and, or you can get online and see how it's doing. So when we're talking about, uh, Chris asked me a question earlier, we are talking about equipment redundancy. We asked, why do we have two boilers? And that would basically be the same principle where if you're living in Iowa uh, and it gets down to zero degrees, you don't want one to fail and not have some way to keep the building warm or you're going to have broken pipes and all kinds of problems. And also, um, the operation of those boilers, um, once, so once in a while we'll get down below zero and one boiler won't be enough and they actually operate in a lead lag system. There is one pressure gauge, that one pressure transducer that looks at the actual steam pressure that controls whether which one of them picks on. And it's exactly right. What will happen is one will kick on if it can't maintain the load and the steam pressure keeps dropping, the second one will kick on at a lower steam pressure. And then when that one comes up to the set pressure, it'll shut off and then the first one will just maintain. So like when it's 10 below, it can handle it, you know, handle the load if a valve opens up and the pressure drops way down. Um, originally, we, we had before the building automation was connected to it, we had a problem where we tried to run one only and then it filled the other one up. And now we've resolved that problem. 
Um, and we also alternate the boilers every 12 hours. Because if you, if you just want one boiler, one steam boiler, which they're both connected to one steam header, one steam line coming to the building, if you only run one, the other one will fill up. Because steam will condensate and you come right back in. And you don't want to start a steam boiler full of water. No. And so we alternate every 12 hours. We'll, we'll, one will be the primary, and then the second one will be the primary. Uh, I could tell by the temperature in this room, and we're directly above the boiler room, that our boiler must be ready to, to, to blow down now if we want to head back down there. So what we have now is uh, Randall's going to blow the relief to test it, and then he's going to blow down the bottom of the boiler to, to get the uh, sludge and debris off, uh, off the bottom of the boiler. Are you ready? Yep. And then so the, the steam valve got to do that. And we get out weekly too, so. Oh great. Well great, thank you, Randall. <laughs>